Okay, welcome to uh, lecture 18, which will complete my remarks on Rousseau's famous second discourse, his discourse on the origin of inequality, and will in fact complete uh, my remarks on Rousseau tout court. This will be the last we hear of him uh, for the rest of this semester, because from here on out, it's going to be pretty much all marks all the time, right up until the end of the course. Um, so the finish line is in sight. Okay, um, so in the last lecture, I uh, described uh, Rousseau's conjectures about the state of nature that he describes in the discourse. And as I was saying in the previous lecture, Rousseau understands the state of nature for the purpose of his discourse uh, somewhat differently from the way in which Locke and Hobbes had construed it. For them, the state of nature was uh, uh, an analytic construct. Uh, the idea was to uh, simply eliminate the state in thought from our reflection on human relations and consider what human life would be like if we didn't have the state and the law to govern us. And as you know, uh, they postulate that uh, if we simply subtract the state from the picture, uh, we would be left with a state of nature that would be rife with inconveniences uh, and uh, insecurity. Uh, and they argue, as you well know by now, that uh, individuals who found themselves in that situation would find it intolerable and would in a variety of ways agree, and indeed you would uh, 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 agree, uh, to establish a state on certain uh, terms. And they regard that argument as defending and legitimating uh, the distinctive powers of the modern uh, sovereign uh, state. Uh, Rousseau, as you know, uh, regards that uh, approach as naive. Uh, and he thinks that Locke and Hobbes haven't really reached uh, the true state of nature, which he construes in much more anthropological terms. He asks us to imagine a far more radical state of nature, uh, one that represents, as it were, the point of origin in the development of the human species um, before any culture, any civilization, has really uh, taken root or gotten off the ground. Uh, as, as you know, uh, Rousseau asks us to imagine individuals who interact even before the uh, establishment of any linguistic uh, capacities, any uh, 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 linguistically mediated consciousness about who they are, what their lives mean, and anything or anything of that uh, kind. So Rousseau is asking us to imagine something much more radical than anything that you find in Hobbes and Locke. And as I said in the previous lecture, he thinks it's necessary to go back further in this way uh, in order to compute in a critically detached way uh, uh, in the round uh, the gains and losses that the human species has incurred in the course of the civilizing uh, process. So the uh, initial state that he postulates in the discourse, as you know, is very different, therefore, from uh, the state of nature as Hobbes and Locke uh, construe it. He describes uh, an almost idyllic uh, natural state uh, in which uh, individuals live together in a state of innocence, uh, a lack of self-consciousness, and in harmony with each other and with uh, nature. Um, individuals in that situation, Rousseau thinks, would have enjoyed a kind of unself-conscious independence uh, from each other. They are indeed activated by a rudimentary kind of self-interest uh, built around easily satiable natural drives and instincts. Uh, that self-interest is qualified only by a sense of natural sympathy or pitié uh, in the face of suffering uh, uh, experienced by fellow sentient uh, beings. And that, he thinks, prevents uh, self-interest from acquiring any kind of acquisitive uh, or uh, vindictive quality, right? And, and of course, as you know, what he's going to say is that uh, as the civilizing process grinds on, uh, uh, that's something that gets introduced. And so the question for him is how do we learn uh, dispositions that lead us to be indifferent to the suffering of others and lead us to contrive 
various forms of vindictiveness and even cruelty uh, towards uh, others. He thinks we have to explain uh, how violence, predation, uh, acquisitiveness, uh, self-importance, how these phenomena um, uh, gain ground as the human species uh, develops. And his point is, uh, as I said in the last lecture, to try to introduce some critical distance on that tendency and to get us to recognize it for what it is, um, and also to uh, make us conscious uh, of uh, a tension uh, between the world that we've created, uh, the world that human civilization uh, has become, uh, and uh, uh, the more innocent, idyllic uh, situation that he thinks is more uh, proper to and, 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 and uh, uh, reflective of uh, our actual natural dispositions towards each other. That's, that's the project. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that um, uh, many uh, are inclined to compare Rousseau's depiction of the noble savage in his state of nature or her state of nature. They compare this idyllic primal state uh, to uh, the sort of uh, 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 fall of man story that you get in tradi traditional uh, theism. Uh, in many ways, there is considerable overlap uh, between the Christian uh, theistic and, and also, of course, he he Hebraic uh, account uh, of uh, the Garden of Eden, in which all went well, um, that then gets uh, poisoned by primal sin in the Garden of Eden, and that then condemns uh, human beings to uh, divided uh, and uh, violent forms of life uh, thereafter. Um, and I think it's also worth uh, noting some other important uh, points of overlap between Rousseau's story um, and the more traditional fall of man narrative that you get in Christian uh, and Judaic uh, uh, theism. Uh, uh, very much like Hobbes, uh, and this is something that both Hobbes and Rousseau get, I'm sure, uh, from Christian theism, there's a strong emphasis on the problem of vanity, um, uh, this tendency, as Rousseau puts it, for us to live in the opinions of others um, and to be constantly worrying about controlling our how we appear to others uh, in order to get ahead, um, in order to... Uh, uh, um, uh, achieve advancement in human uh, social life. Uh, and this is not really something new. This, this emphasis on vanity and vainglory goes right back into medieval uh, Christianity. And in a way, uh, Hobbes and Rousseau, when they uh, emphasize uh, these problems, they're really just echoing the standard Christian critique uh, of vanity and pride um, uh, and aren't uh, uh, really non-traditional in any way. As far back as the 13th century, you'll see, for example, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, uh, listing envy, discord, and contention as the daughters of vainglory. And it's quite clear, I think, that Aquinas is uh, foreshadowing uh, the themes that both Hobbes and Rousseau uh, emphasize in, in, in their work. There's nothing in uh, that claim that envy, discord, and contention uh, are the fruits of vainglory. There's nothing in that with which, say, Hobbes uh, would have strongly uh, disagreed, because, of course, he too thinks uh, that the struggle for glory is part of the problem uh, in the state of nature, and it's one of the things that the state uh, needs to uh, tamp down and gain control over in order to promote peace uh, and security uh, for all. Still, I think it's also important to notice some important differences from uh, between the Rousseauan account, anyway, and the traditional Christian fall of man narrative. Um, one difference is that there is no primal sin in Rousseau's story. Uh, it's not that um, in his state of nature, uh, uh, his noble savages do anything uh, wrong, right? They, 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 they don't eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge and condemn everybody else uh, to, uh, 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 to division because they've committed uh, uh, an original sin, uh, as it's described in traditional Christianity. Uh, for Rousseau, the sins come later. Uh, the sins, the vanity, uh, the division, uh, the self-importance, uh, all of that arrives 
uh, later in the course of human development. And the problem with these uh, sins, if that's what we want to call them on Rousseau's account, is that they represent not disobedience before the will of God, but a kind of disobedience of ourselves and our authentic uh, nature. Uh, so uh, part of what Rousseau is trying to get across is the sense that we've betrayed ourselves in the way in which we have constructed systems of power and domination uh, uh, in the course of the civilizing process, right? So that's an important uh, difference. Um, another difference is that uh, Rousseau in the discourse, um, uh, in a way that I think is not the case for the traditional Christian account, uh, certainly, um, uh, actually has quite a complicated stadial theory of human uh, development. And this was common currency uh, among 18th century commentators. If you read Adam Smith, you'll see that he too uh, had a view uh, uh, under which uh, human civilization goes through various phases or stages. That's what a stadial theory implies here. It implies uh, an attempt to uh, 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 enumerate various stages through which uh, human history passes um, as, as it develops. Um, and of course, this is also going to be very important in Marx, because he too is going to offer his own stadial theory with, you know, uh, hunter-gatherer societies, uh, uh, primitive slave societies, feudalism, and then eventually uh, capitalism. Um, uh, so, but there's nothing really in the Christian theistic tradition that corresponds to that. But I think it's important to uh, just uh, uh, elaborate the stages that Rousseau's discourse um, mentions, right? So this, in, this initial state, which I talked about in the last lecture and have just referenced, this kind of initial pre-conscious, pre-linguistic uh, animal stage uh, in which individuals uh, confront each other and nature in uh, a, an unselfconscious, innocent uh, way, uh, that's uh, the, the uh, starting point uh, from which uh, human civilization on Husserl's account uh, eventually develops. There's then a second stage, which we might refer to as a kind of the stage of primitive tools and weapons. Uh, those of you who've seen uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, uh, fantastic masterpiece movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, will know there's this opening sequence, which is called The Dawn of Man, and, and, and you see these uh, uh, basically human primates you know, living in the, the primitive savanna, um, and they begin to develop the capacity to use tools, right? Um, uh, they have rudimentary language, uh, they have uh, a crude, very uh, basic kind of understanding of property, um, and they start to figure out in creative ways uh, that they can use tools uh, and weapons uh, to defend themselves uh, and to kill prey. Uh, in various ways. Of course, the uh, uh, Space Odyssey, then uh, the Kubrick movie, skips over the later stages in what is probably the greatest cut in the history of modern se uh, at cinema, uh, in which you know you see this uh, uh, early human primate realizing that uh, he can take a bone and use it to uh, kill animals. Uh, and then you see him realizing his power, throwing this bone up into the sky. And then there's this cut from this uh, uh, bone spinning in the heavens directly to a spaceship uh, flying through uh, 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 suborbital space. Uh, just uh, 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 just just off the Earth's surface, um, and uh, that's of course a great famous cut. But in doing that, uh, it, making that cut, Kubrick is of course skipping over the remaining two phases uh, that um, Rousseau distinguishes in the discourse. Because at the third stage, Rousseau uh, in, uh, 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 mentions that there's a, 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 a phase in which human beings start living together in villages. You get kind of hunter-gatherer societies. Um, um, gender roles develop. The, the men go out and do the hunting. Uh, the women stay home in the huts and look after the kids. Um, uh, this is a period during which we have the first stirrings uh, of self-esteem uh, and mutual uh, comparison. Of course, those stirrings Rousseau thinks are going to get us into trouble 
uh, down the line. But nonetheless, uh, he thinks that this period, which he says will have lasted for a very long time, he thinks of it as a kind of golden age. Um, and in some ways, he said, indeed, he says, look, this, this is actually the best it gets, right? So in, in a way, he says, this is even better uh, than the very early stages, the, the, the pre-conscious, pre-linguistic uh, stage. So this, this is not, uh, I want to point out, it's not in Rousseau just a straightforward story of decline. Uh, there is improvement, um, and that's something that he acknowledges in this third stage when he when he says quite explicitly, uh, well, this is the best. This is the best phase. This 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 is a period during which we were able to take advantage of some forms of productive mutual cooperation, um, uh, and we're still relatively able to live uh, in, in a state of peace. And 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 he says at various points that this is roughly speaking uh, the situation of many Aboriginal native peoples in the world. Uh, uh, outside uh, Europe uh, that uh, explorers are coming back and, and giving reports of. Um, so at that point, in the, at this third stage, things are still going, he thinks, uh, pretty well. But uh, what, of course, happens then is that we start to develop agriculture, industry, a full understanding of private property relations. Um, and once that starts happening, uh, we see the development, Rousseau thinks, of uh, distinctions between class and rank, a self-conscious understanding of uh, certain human groups as being relatively wealthy and those relatively deprived and poor. Uh, we see the establishment of social and political institutions that formalize structures of inequality uh, uh, and domination. And this is the phase uh, that we're living in now, or at any rate in the 18th century, uh, in which agents uh, live vainly in the opinions uh, of, of, of others, are constantly worrying about where they fit into these uh, various configurations of inequality, where exactly what class they belong to, what rank they belong to, how much uh, money they have compared to others, uh, uh, and so forth. And, and this, he thinks, is the fruit of um, uh, the establishment of private property uh, and commercial development and industry and agriculture and so forth. And this is the stage at which he thinks everything starts to go badly awry. Um, so uh, it's, it's kind of a curve, right? Things are going well, and then we fall off a cliff, uh, Rousseau thinks, when we uh, start uh, indulging these uh, uh, more complicated, complex uh, divisions of labor surrounding the control of agriculture and industry and the establishment of regimes uh, of uh, private property. That's when things start to really go badly off the rails, according to Rousseau. Um, it's also, uh, I think, worth mentioning here that Rousseau's uh, uh, fall of man story has a cyclical character uh, uh, that I think the Christian theist account doesn't really possess because the upshot of the story is that uh, at the end of the discourse, the end of the second part, we arrive at the state of nature as Hobbes and Locke uh, see it. In a sense, we're put back into uh, the state of nature as a result of the civilizing process. Uh, but the state of nature that we then perceive as a result of especially the fourth stage um, is a, a picture of who we are, as it were, naturally, uh, that simply reflects the power relations, uh, the obsession with vainglory and privilege uh, that is symptomatic of uh, settled, civilized uh, forms of power uh, and control. Um, and uh, Rousseau wants to say, well, this is indeed, in a certain sense, barbaric. It is indeed, uh, in that sense, uh, a state of nature, but it's a kind of barbarism uh, that is actually um, the fruit of what we tend to congratulate ourselves um, as uh, congratulate ourselves on as a form of civilization. And what he's trying to suggest is that actually what we call civilization is in various ways not civilized at all. Um, actually, uh, it's, it's, it's got more in common with various forms of barbarism than we're in a position to acknowledge. Um, so the story has a kind of cyclical, you know, we come full circle and we wind back up uh, at a certain conception of the state of nature, but that state of nature is very far from what Rousseau thinks the real state of nature is. And again, what he's trying to do is to chart the distance uh, we've traveled from a, a natural halcyon state uh, that is not barbaric at all to one in which we tolerate and acquiesce in 
uh, various forms of oppression uh, and barbarism and cruelty, right? That's, that's, that's the structure of this. The central Husovian claim, I take it, in uh, uh, this uh, secularized fall of man story uh, is the thought that the propitious natural balance that we observe or could at least imagine uh, in the initial phase of human uh, society, uh, this natural equilibrium between amour de soi, kind of innocent self-love, and sympathy for the suffering of fellow uh, sentient beings, gets disrupted and kind of scrambled up. Uh, in the course of human development. And what he's trying to expose is the way in which we've become confused about the relationships uh, between our concern for self and our concern for others. Because as you know, what happens, especially at the fourth phase of his uh, 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 stadial theory of human civilization, is that amour de soi, uh, innocent self-love, is replaced by a kind of self-love that is much more problematic. And Rousseau, of course, refers to this as amour propre, a sense of self that is mediated through some conscious understanding of who we are, some conscious sense of self um, that we then evaluate in terms of standards uh, and norms and criteria of inferiority and superiority. Um, this is also the vehicle uh, for vanity and vainglory, Rousseau thinks, because what, what, what comes to matter among beings who are activated by amour propre rather than amour de soi uh, is not the kind of non-comparative, okay, so I need to drink now, let's go to the, let's go to the brook and take some, let's take some water. Uh, uh, rather, what develops is a kind of self-love uh, that distinguishes one's own success uh, uh, and qualities from those of others. Um, and it becomes increasingly important to appear different from others, not just in the sense of being uh, uh, ontologically distinct, but even more uh, in terms of being superior or, or inferior. Um, and and the, um, the reign of amour propre is uh, a psychological tendency in which human beings understand themselves as standing in relations of mutual comparison uh, and mutual esteem. Um, and that's uh, uh, the form that self-love comes to acquire. That's, 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 th th these are attitudes that self-interest uh, uh, comes to uh, take on in the course of the civilizing uh, process for Rousseau. Um, Rousseau thinks that um, amour propre is egoistic, it's, it, it's centered on the interests of a self. Um, but because these interests of the self are now understood in a conscious way in relation to standards of success or superiority and inferiority, uh, he thinks that it's a mistake. This is, I think, very, very important for Rousseau's view. It's a mistake to think that um, in releasing the egoism of amour propre, we're actually re releasing a kind of free expression uh, of uh, self-interest. That, he thinks, is the traditional Enlightenment uh, story, right? By liberating people to pursue their own ambitions as they choose. Uh, the traditional story says, well, people are, are, are liberating themselves uh, from oppressive structures and increasingly able to express themselves for who they are. But Rousseau wants to say, well, it's true that there is a kind of self-interested quality uh, to the forms of egoism that develop in uh, civilized society. It's a mistake to think of these as genuinely free uh, because they're not really independent, right? What amour propre does, Rousseau thinks, is to infect us with an insatiable craving for comparative recognition in the eyes of others. And as a result, the kind of egoism that develops in modern society uh, is not a kind of uh, egoism that expresses our independence from each other. Rather, it's a kind of egoism that makes us unfree because it makes us constantly dependent on the way other people judge us. And so we're constantly worrying in civilized societies, Rousseau thinks, about what other people think of us. Um, and in alien, I mean, this is not a term he uses, but it's certainly, I think, uh, a valid term to apply to Rousseau's analysis. In alienating our success 
to judgments made by others, uh, judgments that we're constantly trying to control, Rousseau thinks we become more and more slavish, far from liberating and freeing us, uh, amour propre rather um, renders us constantly dependent on the way other people see us and the way that we appear to others. So uh, I take it that the lesson of all of this is that the acquisitive drive, which many Enlightenment thinkers, especially those who are apologists for commercial society, see as a, a great vehicle of liberation in the modern world, the acquisitive drive for greater wealth, for greater prestige, for greater social standing, um, is not actually liberating at all. It's actually a, a symptom and cause of oppression of both oneself and oppression of others. It involves uh, oppression of oneself, Rousseau thinks, uh, because uh, one's fortunes viewed through the lens of amour propre come to depend on the capricious recognition of oneself uh, by others. And surely this is, a this is a thing that we all recognize, especially you, as you move through uh, the social life of the modern 21st century uh, uh, research uh, university, prestigious university like UVA, right? We're constantly stressed out uh, about what others think of us, right? Uh, we're, we're constantly trying to get in with the right crowd. We're constantly trying to market ourselves uh, and make sure that people don't draw the wrong conclusions about the kind of people we are. We're constantly choosing what clothes to wear, how to manipulate our appearances so that other people get the right impression, so that we can curry favor with the right people and avoid the wrong people. Um, and, and it's this sort of struggle to define oneself in opposition to the judgment of others and to align oneself with this group rather than that group, uh, that Rousseau thinks we find our, ourselves oppressing ourselves because we're not really being authentic and, and sincere in a lot of this, uh, and we're not really being free in any of this. Rather, we're letting the judgments of others, which are often capricious, uh, determine how we think about uh, our own lives and what we're attempting to uh, achieve. And that, to, again, to use a term that uh, Rousseau doesn't uh, uh, use, but does seem applicable here, that is deeply alienating, right? Because it alienates us from ourselves and our real interests um, and identifies our success or failure in life, not with what we actually need and want, but rather with what other people think of us, right? So that's the sense in which amour propre results in oppression of self. Um, but it also uh, uh, creates, he thinks, oppression of others, uh, because uh, the wealth and standing that you need uh, in order to uh, 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 prove yourself to be what you want to, 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 to appear as, as you want to appear in the eyes of others, right? you need to have the various kinds of socially recognized tokens, badges of success uh, that, pe that you think people will regard uh, as, as being signs that you're a good person, that you deserve their esteem uh, and recognition. Uh, but those tokens and badges of honor uh, become available increasingly only through uh, the productive process. They, they, they presuppose economic cooperation of complicated kinds. They presuppose large-scale industrial and agricultural development. Uh, they presuppose divisions of labor. Uh, they pre presuppose political and institutional uh, organization. And all of that implies the control of some people uh, by others. If you want to have a nice fashionable dress or suit to wear to impress an employer, somebody has to produce the suit or the dress, right? Um, uh, th these things don't just come from nature. Uh, they come from the organized economic uh, uh, production uh, that are uh, controlled by those who have access to um, economic uh, resources. Um, and so we find ourselves caught up, locked into uh, systems of power uh, and control uh, that are complicit in this acquisitive drive for greater wealth um, and standing, right? And in all of this, Rousseau thinks, our natural uh, sentiment of pitié, our natural sentiment of sympathy for the suffering of others tends to atrophy. We become indifferent to others' suffering and become ever more uh, absorbed, self-absorbed in our own ambitions. You know, if you think, for example, about uh, sweatshops, right? I mean, the clothes that you're wearing right now, uh, probably you bought from Walmart or Target or one of these places. 
Um, and you know, at some level, uh, that those clothes are available to you relatively cheaply because people uh, in uh, Bangladesh or the Philippines or some part, other part of the world um, have been uh, producing them under conditions of uh, considerable economic uh, oppression, right? Uh, and we don't like to think about this. It's inconvenient for us to reflect on this, uh, but we find it um, easy to forget that uh, uh, the, the things that we wear are available to, to us on the backs of other people's uh, suffering. Um, and that would be an example of the kind of phenomenon that Rousseau is trying to draw attention to, uh, this tendency to not notice anymore uh, that our own self-absorbed ambitions are being achieved at the expense of others who, if we were more like his noble savage, uh, we would, uh, 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 would naturally uh, occasion our sympathy and p pity. But all of that gets lost and suppressed as all of us get more and more self-absorbed um, and um, uh, uh, obsessed by uh, uh, the uh, promptings and imperatives of amour propre. So that, I think, is the core claim uh, in uh, the narrative of corruption and vanity that develops in the second half of the Discourse on the Origin of Equality. Um, just to uh, go back briefly to du contrat social, I think it should now be clear how and why Rousseau thinks that his arguments in du contrat social purport to offer a solution uh, to the kind of problem that he's describing in uh, uh, this narrative in the discourse. Um, remember, uh, Rousseau's uh, social contract begins with this <coughs> ringing declaration that man is born free but everywhere is in chains. And the question is, how can chain, these chains, which he doesn't think can be uh, eliminated entirely, how can they be reconciled with an idea of the independence and freedom of each individual? And Rousseau's uh, uh, social contract is animated by uh, the aim of restoring the lost independence, the independence uh, that we enjoyed, he thinks, in the early stages of human development. How do we restore that lost independence um, against the background of the inevitable dependence of modern complex societies. And his social contract is an attempt to uh, answer that question or, or, or to explain how we can uh, reappropriate uh, uh, an independence and freedom that is now under threat as a result of the civilizing process. So just to remind you uh, of uh, Rousseau's social compact in Du Contrat Social, uh, Rousseau says, well, you can, you can address this uh, by constructing sovereignty in such a way that it becomes a radically democratic artifact. Each citizen gains an equal voice in public decision-making as a member of the sovereign. And as you know, the sovereign has a general will uh, uh, that represents the freedom and self-government of everyone uh, and will, he supposes, uh, be uh, naturally oriented towards protecting the independence of each associate. Right, um, and and so he thinks. Now he, he might be wrong to think this, but but but, but this is certainly the intention. Uh, uh, deferring to the general will as it emerges under his social compact is supposed to guard against public rules that shore up and reinforce the systems of privilege that he think are symptomatic of the rule of amour propre. Right. Um, so again, as Rousseau contends, you might be skeptical whether the formula works, but again, the, the, the aim anyway uh, is to devise a political structure in which uh, the general will, um, as Rousseau understands it, won't emerge under, and in fact won't tolerate, large economic and political inequalities, as he explicitly says in Du Contrat uh, Social. So he, he thinks of the general will uh, as being an institutionalized guarantor, if you get the social compact right, uh, he thinks of it as guarding against the forms of inequality and domination uh, that will otherwise uh, uh, dominate uh, human relations if we make no effort to rein in the forces of amour propre in modern uh, society. So I take it that uh, Rousseau's clear intention in Du Contrat Social is then to simulate through institutional artifice uh, the humane balance of amour de soi and pitié uh, that he postulates would have existed in his state of nature. Uh, he is trying, I think, in Du Contrat Social to accept uh, 
that amour propre is something that we're not going to be able to unlearn. It is now an established and settled feature of uh, human psychology, and there's no point in trying to erase it. We have to work with it. But the point of the formula of Rousseau's social compact uh, is to harness amour propre and the way it works so that instead of becoming an excuse for oppression, constant status anxiety, vainglory, ambition, cliqueishness, social division, and so forth, uh, uh, the social contract is supposed to harness uh, and uh, uh, recruit amour propre to a regime that promotes a sense of equality, freedom, and mutual independence. That, at any rate, I think is his clear intention, um, and I hope it's now clear how uh, du contrat social answers to some of the problems that Rousseau enumerates in the discourse. Now, uh, Rousseau's proposed cure in du contrat social may or may not work. We, we talked a little bit about some of the ambiguities of his solution, whether it actually is only going to uh, condemn human societies to uh, unacceptably totalitarian forms of control. But I want to uh, uh, conclude this lecture just by focusing uh, on his diagnosis of the problem in the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality, which, as I've said, is, I think, wider and of greater historical import than the particular solution that he proposes in uh, the social contract. Uh, notice a couple of things about his diagnosis, right? Um, uh, Rousseau's uh, efforts in the discourse can be thought of as consciousness raising in a sense that we uh, recognize um, and associate with the radical left tradition. His object in the second discourse is in line with that radical left tradition to raise his reader's consciousness by uh, uh, getting them to recognize, by getting you to recognize that the accepted way of proceeding under civilized conditions uh, is, is deeply problematic. We shouldn't, we shouldn't just pat ourselves on the back with uh, uh, a flattering enlightenment uh, narrative about how we've solved all of these problems and how we're now free in a way that we weren't back in the Dark Ages. That, Rousseau thinks, is a naive and superficial way of thinking about uh, how human societies in the modern world uh, are actually working out. And Rousseau aims to accomplish this uh, consciousness raising in the discourse, not simply through uh, rational argumentation, right? He's, he's not giving you a sort of logical syllogism that is attempting to demonstrate logically uh, that there's a problem with the existing regime. Uh, rather, he is trying to excite emotions. He's trying to elicit from you um, an in emotional response, as it were, from the perspective of the noble savage, who he believes is kind of deep down there psychologically in you, but suppressed and repressed by the forces of civilization. And he's trying to kind of tweak uh, that underlying um, part of you, uh, bring these repressed feelings of uh, uh, human solidarity to light, uh, re-excite uh, our, our attitudes of pitié uh, and sympathy for the suffering of our fellow beings, um, and, and to use that to jolt you out of any tendency to just uh, uh, drink the Kool-Aid of the traditional enlightenment uh, narrative of remorseless, inevitable uh, improvement. Um, and so, uh, uh, hence the structure of the discourse, right? That it's an attempt to document uh, through a kind of it's psychologically plausible conjecture how the most important latent capacities of the species, especially our capacity to use language, to set standards, to compare ourselves to one another, to bolster our sense of esteem, uh, and to engage in mutual evaluation, it's an attempt to document how those latent capacities get commandeered in the process of civilization as oppression, division, insecurity, anxiety, and vanity. Right? That's, the, that's the way this argument is supposed to work. And as I say, the object of uh, his central comparison with the, as he sees it, enviable state of our forebears is itself to excite this faculty of perfectibility, which I talked about in the last lecture. He says, look, I'm going to give you a hymn of praise to our first ancestors. Um, and part of what he's saying in describing this as a hymn of praise um, is that he's trying to reignite a sense of deep respect uh, 
uh, for latent human uh, feelings and emotions, especially uh, 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 unselfconscious independence uh, and a sense of commitment and concern for uh, the well-being and suffering of others, he's trying to uh, excite all of that um, and to get you to realize that we can be better than we've let ourselves become. So he's directly trying to stimulate a sense of dissatisfaction with the existing uh, arrangement in the modern world uh, and to stimulate human beings to think again about whether we have to live in the depraved, corrupted, vainglorious, ambitious, um, uh, uh, divided way uh, that he thinks we do under modern conditions. So his his object, I think, is to jolt his readers out of a kind of complacent acceptance uh, of uh, 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 conventional practices that we ought, if we're being honest with ourselves, uh, seek to overturn uh, and repudiate. Um, there are three tendencies in particular that Rousseau is uh, particularly concerned to highlight. One is the tendency for political authority and patterns of economic d domination to be determined by de facto power relations and our, our, our willingness to just accept that uh, where the chips happen to fall through sheer luck, the people who happen to inherit wealth and capital and economic resources, uh, we, we tend, Rousseau thinks, to think about the structures of uh, political authority as just natural facts, just the way they, things are going to have to be. And Rousseau wants to say, no, that's, that, that's a mistake. And if you make that mistake, what you're doing is confusing might with right. It, you're, you're just, you're, you're just uh, uh, equating um, the actual uh, uh, threat advantage of some groups over others. You're equating it with what is naturally right. And I talked about this a little bit in the lectures on uh, uh, the social contract. And of course, his target there is the social contract tradition again, because he thinks that the way they understand natural right, uh, it tends to ratify de facto power relations. And it lacks any mechanism for enabling us to see that the de facto power relations that exist among human beings are not necessarily um, as they should be. Um, uh, again, this takes us a little bit away from the discourse, but it's clear in the little pamphlet on the state of war and various references in both the discourse and the social contract. Um, Rousseau wants to draw attention to the accumulation of the means of violence and the structures of state power in the modern world, the concomitant propensity toward war. Again, he shares with Hobbes a kind of sense of despair uh, that in supposedly civilized societies in the 17th and 18th century in Europe, uh, what do you see? Not peace and harmony, uh, but more or less constant uh, military conflict among the major uh, European uh, powers. Um, and whereas uh, Hobbes wants to kind of naturalize that uh, uh, propensity in a story about the state of nature that says, well, that's how it would be. Um, that, that's just a kind of basic uh, given fact about human psychology. Rousseau wants to say, no, this is not just a basic natural fact. Uh, this is just an artifact, uh, a reflection of the forms of state uh, power that are now in place. And these are the things that we ought to regard as objects of our deep uh, suspicion. So that's a second uh, major aim. Thirdly, and somewhat uh, uh, more uh, pertinently to private life, uh, Rousseau wants to draw our attention to our tendency to overinvest in uh, social vanity, right? To lose ourselves in the opinions of others. And in that sense, to become uh, slaves to fashion, uh, slaves to other people's per uh, 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 perceptions of us. Now, of course, in the uh, 18th century, Rousseau's primary models for this phenomenon uh, uh, were the effectiveness of courtly life. You know, you know, courtiers going off to Versailles in Paris and trying to curry favor with, uh, with, with, uh, with powerful elites. Um, and we've sort of gotten rid of that for the most part. But the phenomenon that Rousseau describes surely still persists today, uh, albeit in somewhat different forms, forms that he would uh, not have uh, perhaps anticipated, but certainly, I think, would have uh, decried. Uh, think about the way market relations and advertising uh, and, and, and uh, publicity work, right? Uh, uh, you, know, you turn on the TV and you get these these commercials that that, that that constantly flatter your vanity. You know, you 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 buy this kind of car, you get a Lexus and so forth, and you'll instantly become more sexually attractive to women or something something like that. So that's a crude version, but but you know what I'm getting at, right? Uh, the way that um, powerful economic interests 
get you to acquire needs for certain kinds of economic goods um, is by appealing to your amour propre. And, and Rousseau would certainly see the, the, the advertising industry, the public relations industry, as constantly appealing to suspect forms of vanity um, and thereby entrenching false and inauthentic needs, right? Uh, uh, needs that are not easy to satisfy, needs that, of course, we all depend on for our livelihoods and jobs, but also wants to draw attention to the way in which this is all pathological. It's not something that really uh, corresponds to what we really want to live a, a, a satisfying life. Um, and he also, of course, wants to draw attention to the way in which these, these complicated and inauthentic needs that we acquire uh, and that answer to our amour propre uh, are very difficult to satisfy in comparison with the relatively easily satiable needs uh, that uh, uh, would have existed uh, in the state of nature. Uh, fashion and conspicuous consumption. I've already mentioned that, right? The, you know, the desire to buy for yourself a flashy car or a flashy uh, house or to wear flashy clothes. Why do people do this? Well, because they want to make a good impression on others. Again, this is all pure uh, amour propre. My wife uh, sometimes watches these, you know, Real Housewives of, of New York or L.A. or Beverly Hills or whatever, and I can only watch them for a few minutes at a time because I find the behavior of the individuals so so revolting that I, I, I can't I can't bear it. But she seems to have a sort of weird fascination uh, for it. She's not like that herself, happily. Uh, but 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 she, you know, she, she she's I think drawn to these shows just because there's something that's psychologically compelling about them. Um, uh, if you want a kind of contemporary example of amour propre at full stretch, uh, turn, turn on one of those shows and you'll, 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 you'll see exactly the phenomena uh, that Rousseau is complaining about. Uh, the constant pressure to conform to conventional ideals of beauty, sexual attractiveness, right? The, 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 uh, you know, the, the phenomenon of eating disorders, right? You have, to, you, have to stay, you have to stay thin if you want to make the right sort of impression, right? The, the stigmatization of people who are overweight or obese, right? Uh, again, th this is a classic example of the operation of uh, amour propre as Rousseau sees it. The continued importance of prestige, especially in educational and professional life uh, in our society, right? The, the, these two are, are absolutely classic examples of the phenomenon of amour propre that Rousseau is uh, trying to push back against. So um, I think it's still the case that uh, uh, the discourse is a timely plea against the pretentiousness, insincerity, superficiality, and indeed inhumanity of much modern uh, social existence. And uh, you, you will, I'm sure, have some interesting discussions uh, in your uh, sections this week about this, because I, I think it will speak uh, quite directly to concerns that all of you uh, will will um, have about your own life. So I look forward to hearing how those uh, go. Let me end with one last point that I also think is uh, perhaps worth considering in your discussion sections. I've emphasized in these lectures that the discourse on the origin of inequality launches a kind of characteristically radical left critique of modern uh, commercial society. I put commercial in uh, brackets there because it's actually a little bit unclear how far Rousseau is really attacking commercial society as opposed to other uh, aspects of amour propre. So, so you, you know, one needs to be a bit careful about that. Um, I also want to point out that at least some forms of uh, radical left um, uh, agitation in the 21st century that are very popular uh, uh, today are, I think, arguably quite at odds with Rousseau's approach. And I just want to end by pointing out this tension uh, for what it's worth. And you can think about this perhaps in your, in, in your sections and in your own reflection. Um, th there is a tendency, um, especially uh, in uh, academic political theory these days, uh, among figures who think of themselves as representing uh, the radical left um, to invest in uh, what often travels under the designation of identity politics uh, and uh, uh, what is often described as an agonistic conception uh, of politics. And the figures who uh, take this kind of line, I'm thinking in particular of the American political theorist uh, Bill Connolly, uh, the Belgian political theorist Chantal Mouffe, M-O-U-F-F-E, I wish I had a surname like that. Um, I'm thinking particularly of figures like this, who are heavily influenced by the late 19th century German thinker Friedrich Nietzsche, and by the early 20th century uh, uh, German thinker Karl Schmitt. Uh, Karl Schmitt in particular, I think, is an important figure 
figure in this tradition. Uh, Schmidt is famous for conceptualizing the political uh, as uh, inherently bound up in consciousness of friends and enemies, adversaries and opponents. Some of you will have encountered these kinds of arguments uh, in, other, in other classes. And those who've been heavily influenced today uh, by that agonistic uh, uh, vision of politics uh, in which uh, individuals are constantly trying to antagonistically define their identities in opposition to a world of difference, uh, they see great, great hope in this uh, view of the political because they think that it, it's actually something that fuels a desirable vitality uh, in democratic uh, uh, politics. Um, and this is also sometimes not always connected to a view about overcoming oppression uh, that equates it with extorting a kind of existential recognition for one's identity from others who are perceived to be uh, different. Um, I'm, I'm sure all of you, whether or not you've taken classes uh, in this sort of area, will, will recognize, at least broadly speaking, this kind of way of, of, of thinking about politics and will recognize it as something that today uh, the radical left uh, very often appropriates uh, for itself, for, for good or ill. And I, I just want to point out that I, I think there are reasons to think that Rousseau would have been deeply suspicious of this. I'm not, I'm not taking a position, I'm just wanting to point out uh, that this is uh, 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 while it's part of the same radical left tradition uh, that Rousseau himself launches, I don't think it's at all obvious that it's something that Rousseau would have been keen on. Because this agonistic identity politics turn uh, that is very prevalent and fashionable today arguably reinforces rather than ameliorates the very tendencies that he denounced as symptoms of the worst aspects uh, of modern uh, civilized institutions, quote unquote, civilized uh, institutions. If you look at the passages on pages 88 to 9 in your reader, uh, for example, Rousseau speaks uh, and, and criticizes the frenzy to distinguish oneself that, he says, nearly always keeps us outside ourselves because it makes all people competitors, rivals, or rather enemies. It turns us into so many contenders running uh, the same race. Um, uh, and that sort of language is, of course, indulged by the agonists because they see the political as constantly a matter of defining relationships of friendship and enmity, of defining oneself in opposition to some adversary or some opponent with whom one then contests, right? And very often these contemporary thinkers regard this contestation as something that is ineradicable. And I think Rousseau would have uh, resisted that suggestion very strongly, right? As he says, uh, uh, again on those same pages, uh, Rousseau is very explicit. We should not, he says, let politics restrict the honor of defending the common cause. And when he refers to the common cause here, he's referring to something like common humanity, things that we share, right? Feelings of uh, sympathy for the suffering of others uh, uh, and uh, uh, empathy with oppression that are shared across the species and are not simply things that are appreciable only from narrow partisan uh, points of view. And I, I think if you look at those passages, you'll see that there's a deep tension uh, again, it's up to you to decide who's on the right side of this tension. But I think there is, I think, a, a, a deep tension between the vision of the radical left approach that you find in Rousseau uh, and the one that has become more popular today and that travels under the label of uh, agonism and identity politics. So I leave that uh, with you to uh, chew on in your discussion sections, uh, and I hope you uh, get something uh, interesting out of those conversations. So thank you very much for listening. See you soon.